to the Tech Trends Podcast, where we discuss the latest manufacturing, technology, research, and news. Today's episode is sponsored by the MFG Conference. I am Ramia Lloyd, and I'm here with... I'm Alyssa Davis. Stephen Lamarca. I'm Benjamin. Hi, guys. Hi, <laughs> Ramia, I heard we did something with dogs and 3D printing. Oh, my gosh. So, last week, uh, MC Michael Mark and I took a little road trip to New Jersey. We went to go visit... Um, we did a Rockstar shoot for the 24 ad campaign, but mm-hmm. we also went to go visit Dive Designs, and it was so much fun. They're like a 3D printing company, and they do uh, uh, 3D pets and also Willow. I think that's just called Willow, mm-hmm. which is very nice name, by the way. But mm-hmm. um, 3D pets, I don't know if you saw the like big billboard or like the Apple commercial a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. with the They were like recording on the phone and mm-hmm. the dog. So freaking cute. I got to meet all the dogs, and they were so much fun, but... They 3D print prosthetics for animals who need prost- mm-hmm. prosthetics. Prostheses? Yeah, that's the word I was looking for, but I didn't want to. I thought you were about to say prostate. <laughs> I was <laughs> low key, I was about to, <laughs> but I knew that wasn't right, so I said pro. Anyway, they 3D print prostheses for pets, and they were so freaking cute. I'm. So excited to see them. The whole interview was amazing. And there's yeah. the dog Trip is the one. He's like a Rottweiler. And he's just the fluffiest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I fucking he's love just, Rottweilers. He's just walking around with the cutest little face. And then after we like recorded, we all sat down. And they were just like sunbathing. And I was like, this is my happy place. I never want to leave. A sunbathing dog is very cute to look Yeah. No, he yeah. was yeah. So, so cute. And then the way they like 3D print. And they showed us where they like print all the stuff mm-hmm. in-house. And mm-hmm. it's just so cool to see how they like – they. Do um, a three scan. Yeah, the scan, yep. and then it yeah. just prints. It's the freaking coolest thing. Also, Willow is a new thing that they have, and they three D print cheese, but it's like oh. a three D printed like I base, love this. Okay. right? It's a three D printed base, and then the tree itself has like a felt, and it's like sound absorbing. It's so cool. We're getting one for uh, IMTS and Form Next. What mm-hmm. is Willow? It's their uh, 3D printed. It's their like it's like 3D printed furniture technically for like office spaces and like hotels. It's a and brand. Stuff. Yes, mm-hmm. it's a brand okay. under Dive. Okay. Yeah, and they 3D print like office furniture and stuff. But one of their current things is like 3D printed trees, which is so cool. We're getting one hopefully for the studio, nice. and we're gonna put it in That's the corner, awesome. <laughs> and it's gonna be on the main stage at IMTS. That's yeah. incredible. Nice. My dog Charlie, his uh, his first love was was an, another female golden doodle named. Uh, Named uh, Willow. Oh, that's oh I love that. That's fun so, connection. But they also, moved to they moved to Richmond. Oh no. Oh. Also, the Renee rap song, or in the Taylor Swift song. <laughs> oh, <absolutely>. Yeah, <laughs> look at so that. Many. So many. A lot of song so references. So many. Um, and I do like their life cycle. So it's not just you know the end result of three D printing prosthetics. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's you know they have to design and then manufacture and make sure it fits. They're basically making a custom part every single time. Every time it's custom. So it's fascinating that you know they're able to capture um, you know what the negative of the should be and then the reverse engineer of what the positive should be and then they print from there so it's it's a really interesting process it's i One mean and i think as, as it becomes more mainstream it could also be really helpful for animals in shelters because sure. animals with things like missing limbs or <laughs> um things where they need a prosthetic mm-hmm. are harder to adopt yeah. because Absolutely. they have medical issues yep. um or they or the person has to pay for the prosthetic out of pocket so yeah. um yeah. Yeah, I work at, I, I volunteer at the animal shelter, so mm-hmm. like I'm all for that. Nice. Back in the day, I went to um, uh, a conference called East Conference in uh, in Arkansas, mm-hmm. um, and that was basically a a really advanced public school science fair using manufacturing technologies, and I think one of the winners, in, at least in the top three, was this little boy named Arkham Arkham, and he. Uh, uh, he only has one leg. He was mm. born that way. And, um, um, you know, insurance is really tough these days. And you're only granted, he was only granted by his insurance company a new prosthetic every three years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And when you're a little kid, yeah. like, you're constantly growing. Yeah. And every three years isn't going to cut it. Like, right. like you're constantly, like... You're going to want to print. Well, anyway, he got into his teacher helped him get into 3D printing and learn CAD. And they did a 3D scan of his uh, of his um, uh, shorter leg. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, he's been printing uh, a prosthetic for himself like every couple months instead of every three years. It was really cool. That was I wonder where he is now. I hope he's doing manufacturing things. I think he is. Something similar. So on a related tangent, 
I need some help naming a future dog. There's a dog on the horizon. Mm. Where the horizon is, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Uh, but I was wondering, what, what, are you, what are your thoughts on naming pets? Let's, let's so there's a multitude of factors. Oh, man. One being <laughs> breed. Okay. Um, second being, is it a rescue? Is it a purebred? Because rescues come with names. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right? true. So mine will be a rescue. Okay. So And some names fit, right? Okay. So my parents' dog, his name is, is Rex. Okay. Um, and he came to them. We, they got him when he was two, well, about two years old. He, and he came with the name Rex, and it fits him. It's nice. great. Um, his sister's name, uh, not his biological sister, his, the dog we adopted a few months later, her name is Regina, mm-hmm. but her original name was Chicago. Okay. Mm. And we changed that. Um, so, and then there's also, like, my cat. My cat's name is Boots. Yep. Because she has a disability, which means she walks kind of funny. Like, she lifts her feet when she walks, and so her name is Boots because she walks like she has rain boots on. Nice. So... I think like when you when you look at an animal, one when you look at it, you'll know when it's the right animal. Okay, you will know when it's the right yeah. dog. Absolutely. And yeah. two, you'll know if their name fits them. Okay. That's my that's my opinion, but just don't give it like a weird human name. <laughs> Jim. Kevin. Kevin. This is a, this is a <laughs> shout out to Melissa. That's a dog from Up. It, Mo Isn't named it? her dog it Kevin. Is. Yeah, it Kevin. Is. My best friend's Kevin. husband's name is Kevin. Oh, that's so weird. Mm. multiple times I'm like Kevin, and everyone's confused. Yeah. Oh, okay. When we got when we got Charlie during the pandemic, Melissa had wanted a golden doodle for a very long time, and I wasn't ready for another dog. Um, after my after my family dog's passing, um. But uh, when we got, when I finally came to terms of like for us getting a dog, um, I came to it because I had h- recently heard the name Rakesh, right? Which is an, a very common Indian name, and um, our our friend and colleague Sharab uh, had told me one time that all Indian names have a meaning, and. Um, and when I looked, so I, I decided to look up the Hindi meaning meaning for the name Rakesh, and I found out that um, the name Rakesh means Lord of the Full Moon. That's cool. And I'm like, that, that is, cool. is an amazing <laughs> dog name. Absolutely. And I went to Melissa, and I was like, we can get a dog <clears throat> under one condition. I get to name it, because I was going to name this dog <laughs> Rakesh. Yeah, yeah. But to, Mo- to, to Alyssa's point, um, we learned very quickly on the way home with, with young Charles, um, he was not. <laughs> he was not yeah. He's a Charlie. Yeah. He's a Charlie. He's a Charlie. And that's the name Melissa always won. I want to name it. I don't care if it's a boy or girl. It's a perfect unisex name. We're naming him Charlie. And it's like, he's definitely a Charlie. So mm-hmm. lesson learned, Melissa always wins. Yeah. <laughs> spouse. Happy, happy spouse, happy house. That's uh, the 2024 way of saying yeah. that, by the way. I got my dog at nine weeks old. She was a little tiny baby. And it was a whole litter. They like got the mom off the street when mm-hmm. she was pregnant. So they had the litter. And their whole litter was like a pasta. They were pasta puppies. <laughs> <laughs> and so her name is Noki. And she had a brother named Farfla and Orzo oh, and Tortellini. Well, and they cool. were all so cute. But like I... I was talking to my sister-in-law at the time, and I was like, I don't know if I want to keep the name Noki. And as soon as I saw her, I was like, that is a little pasta if I've ever seen one. <laughs> Your dog looks like she a Noki. She looks yeah. like a Noki. <laughs> like, she just looks like a little, when she, especially when she was a little baby, she would always crawl up. Mm. And I was like, you look like a pasta. Like, you're, you look like a Noki. So That's fine. It yeah, fits. yeah. We, we've got, got a neighbor that has an Italian whippet named Tony. Short that, for rigatoni. That, that, uh, um, oh. <laughs> um, um, and uh, my friend up in Massachusetts, Kyle, he he got a uh, dog last year or two years ago now. Um, Ravi for ravioli. Oh, and yeah. uh, dog looks like a ravioli. Yeah, see? <laughs> so, square ravioli. Thing. Well, pudgy. <laughs> pudgy. Definitely looks like, you know, just a scoop of the filling <laughs> that you put inside the pasta. My, my sister adopted uh, an older dog, and it's a tiny little scruffy little black mm-hmm. terrier mix. And it came with the name Nut. Just Nut. Yeah. Nothing yeah. else. And they were like, we're going to change it. Okay. They officially adopted her like six months ago. They have not changed that name. (laughs) And like she kind of looks like a nut. But every time I tell people that their dog's name is Nut, they're like, is it it short for something? (laughs) I call her Nutter Butter because that's that's much cuter. That dog would have six nicknames by now. (laughs) Yeah, my sister calls her Nut Butt. That's a a great snack from the 90s. Yeah. (laughs) I literally just Uh, ate one. Did you? Name name your dog Danimals. Danimals. (laughs) Dunkaroos. Dunkaroos. Oh. (laughs) Name after snacks. That's pretty good. Yeah. 
Ramia, can you tell us about today's sponsor? Manufacturing continues to grow at a rapid rate. Stay ahead of the curve at the MFG meeting this April. The MFG meeting is the ultimate gathering of manufacturing technology minds, bringing together a community of solutions and solvers. Learn how to keep pace with growing demand, make lifelong connections, and see what opportunities lie on the horizon. Go to amtonline.org slash events to register. Awesome. Thanks, Ramia. Anytime. Steven? <laughs> Things are moving on the test bed. Things are moving on. The t- well, not literally, <laughs> but um, <laughs> they will be soon. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, um, <laughs> well, we've made a lot of progress. Chloe and I have, with the help of Russ and his amazing project management skills. Who hates project managing? <laughs> um, but uh, um, Chloe's been tackling the software side of things. I've been tackling the hardware side of things. Um, Chloe has our new Raspberry Pi Five up and running with the MT Connect agent. Um, And we're hopeful that the Raspberry Pi 5 is powerful enough to manage the agents for the entire test bed. That's cool. In the past, we had a Raspberry Pi, a single Raspberry Pi per device on the test bed. And the most we had at one time was um, three Raspberry Pis managing three devices. Uh, managing the data coming from three devices, rather. Um, but now the Pi, the Pi 5, um, has the agent running, and she's got the MT Connect adapter on our new Pocket NC. And I think she's probably going to wrap up this week getting the um, MT Connect adapter on the iGES Rebel 6, nice. which is a big deal because that's a brand new, That's that this robot is relatively new, mm-hmm. and it's never had an MT Connect agent. Mm. developed for it before. So we can put that in the history books that the IGES Rebel 6 is now MT Connect ready. If you go to the MT Connect user portal, nice. mtcup.org or something like that. It's like a wiki page for MT Connect things. Um, but uh, on the hardware side of things, so we've got the difficult to find bolts. We use the nuclear option of McMaster car to, to get the right spec hardware to mount the gripper to the end of arm tooling bracket. And now we need the right hardware to get the bracket on to the end of the arm, which is going to be a lot easier. I actually saw the bolts the first time we were there or the first time I went to the hardware store, didn't think to grab them like a dummy because I wasn't worried about them at the time. I was worried about other hardware that was near impossible to get. Um, That's the next step. Uh, Then after that, the following step will be to source a eight pin GX connector to complete the cable uh, that will connect um, the, the, the the wired connection from the robot to the gripper. So nice. And then the next step after that will be to function check the gripper. And then the next step after that will be to uh, design and manufacture or design and produce uh, soft jaws for the gripper. Okay. And then we can figure out what the hell the robot's going to do. Fun. <laughs> Grip stuff? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have a bunch of scenarios in mind. Uh, We've got a lot of different plans. We've got a lot of plans in case uh, all of the plans fail. <laughs> We're, it's, it's a lot of backup plans. Yeah. We've experienced a lot of failure. I'm um, really good at it. It's like Plankton and SpongeBob when he's got like the big drawer full of plans. <laughs> and it's just yeah. A through Z. I have not seen that, but I want to see it now. I think it's because... in the movie. I think it's in the SpongeBob movie. Okay. I've Sorry, never seen a SpongeBob movie. That might have been a movie. deep cut reference. <laughs> That's okay. No. So transitioning to a bunch of things mm-hmm. we found recently, Alyssa found something where Japan's headed to the moon. Yes. Yeah. Sick. Um, Sick. So as you guys know, I have some history with Japan. I, I spent four years there as a kid. So and I'm wearing my Yokota Air Force Base shirt today. So I figure we should probably talk about Japan today, you know? Absolutely. Um, so this is from um, Nikkei Asia. So it's about two astronauts from Japan will set foot on, foot on the moon through the Lunar Exploration Program led by NASA. So this is under the Artemis Program. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'll be there by 2028. Um, so, and this will be the first time the since the Apollo Program of uh, since the 60s and 70s they'll be putting someone on the moon. So it's a pretty it's a pretty big deal. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, they selected the candidates in 2023. Yeah. I like the fascinating, you know, it's a collaborative approach, right? It, NASA's uh, mm-hmm. Artemis program along with Japan getting there because they've had a pretty healthy space yeah. program also. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting that, uh, you know, it's been such a long time. Everyone's talking about Mars. Mm-hmm. 
but getting to Moon is just as, almost it's just as difficult. Really cool. It's still really cool. Yeah. I mean, there's now a second country mm-hmm. that's made it to the Moon, yep. mm-hmm. uh, India, mm-hmm. in, in, in recent events. That's right. This is really exciting for me because as, as proudly American as I am, um, I'm more proud of my small stint in science mm. and uh, in education um, because I'm a big fan of scientific units, scientific standardized units of measurement. And I, I, I really can't stand that our manufacturing industry insists on using imperial units of measurement when you're programming um, um, manufacturing programs, G-code. Sure. It's like I remember really quickly – in 2016, when we got our first pocket NC, it was like, I'm programming and measuring everything in millimeters. We're not <laughs> inches. What, what are we? You know, like animals? Or are we barbarians? No, we're using scientific units. And then, like, that did not last long. That yep, was maybe yep. a week before <laughs> using inches. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm really excited to this because for, like, the longest time, the uh, the, the argument for, for SAE or Imperial – uh, was well, you know what? You can use millimeter. I don't care if it's standard, if, if it's the scientific standard. You can use millimeters once you've been to the moon. And it's like, <laughs> yes, please get more countries on the yes. moon that are our allies. Um, but um, this makes me want to talk about Air Force things because because do you guys have a favorite uh, 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 fighter jet? <laughs> no. I did. I lived across the highway from the Air Force Base. So I lived in Colorado. From I'm sorry, the Air Force Academy. Um, so we'd always see like the Blue Angels. Oh yeah, fly over fly the F-18s for a while. That was pretty cool. They were very loud, and people would yeah. just literally pull off to the side of the road on the freeway and just like watch the Blue Angels fly over for graduation. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I uh, my old history with the military fighters was I used to build a lot of plastic model airplanes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like 148 scale, and then yeah. went up from there. So the F-14 is probably the most. Yeah, it's America's, America's sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. it was a giant big old ball flying through the sky. But I mean, the movable wings. So yeah, the the B one was also uh, had movable wings too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was very complex. So yeah, that's probably my. Those favorite. are extreme. It's definitely fascinating to me though that like Japan has always been so technologically advanced, and they're they haven't gone to the moon yet. Yeah, yeah. You so, know. Well, it's because I think they're wrapped up in a lot of like Western uh, red tape. Uh, bureaucracy yeah. because because okay so i think my favorite japanese my favorite fighter jet is the japanese f2 sure. um the viper zero mm-hmm. which as you can might be able to tell from the name is based off of the american f-16 viper mm-hmm. if you call it the fighting falcon you're a nerd <laughs> everybody <laughs> refers to it as the viper um but the f-16 is probably my favorite because it's the most mass produced yeah it's the most Still technologically viable. It's mm-hmm. still a viable aircraft today, even though it was made forever ago. Um, super high performance, super low cost, super low maintenance, and you can stuff all of the bombs on it. <laughs> um, Japan does what Japan the Japanese do best, and what did they do to make the F-2? They took an F-16, put a wide body kit on it, <laughs> and they made the F-2 to put even more bombs <laughs> on it. And the Japanese... As much as I like it, they don't like it as much as I do sure. because they're like, this cost us so much money. <laughs> mm. Because General yeah. Dynamics and everybody else who was involved with the F-16 was like, if, Jap- if J- Japan does anything to it, they have to do it on our behalf. Mm. So we have to n- like yay or nay right. on any right. modifications they make and we get the IP to it. So mm-hmm. they, had, they spent so much money on making the F-2 for something – that was supposed to be a really inexpensive aircraft. <laughs> mm. yeah, that's where we are today. Yeah. So I found something on 3D printing. Uh, so 316, stainless steel version, 316L actually. Mm-hmm. It's cro- supposedly corrosion resistant, so you can use it in harsh environments. Uh, it's not supposed to corrode. So if you do see corrosion on 316, it's because of material coming off like cutters or rollers, stuff like that. Um, uh, so they've had an issue of 3D printing 316, uh, getting um, porosity or you know, mysterious uh, pitting in, uh, on the material itself. Uh, so I found an article from uh, physics.org on a research paper from Lawrence Livermore, great facility over in the West Coast. They're doing a great amount of research in additive um, printing processes. Uh, and they discovered a common issue uh, as they're printing, and it actually occurs in welding. So they're getting uh, corrosion caused by slag. Uh, it's, um, you know, extra material or oxidation and throughout the printing process. And you'll see that on, like, 
oil and gas where they actually use the slag as a protective barrier as they're uh, um, um, welding these big parts. Um, and they're using uh, a couple of different processes and some other materials to help reduce this. Uh, so I thought it was very interesting where, you know, everyone's interested in like titanium, yeah. Inconel, mm -hmm. but a 316 has got some life and it's a very... <laughs> 316 that does have, you know... It's very useful. They talked about uh, how useful it is in uh, salt water conditions, so like mm -hmm. boats and, uh, um, you know, naval facilities. Very popular in marine yeah. applications. Yeah. And we saw some very interesting... Uh, I've run across some very interesting propeller designs recently where the propellers are like movable or yeah. counter-rotating. So there's a lot of innovation going on with uh, naval uh, yeah. boats and stuff. I'll be honest, though. I think 316 is a little overrated unless we're talking about explicitly marine environments. Sure. Because, like, where a lot of people, like, sh are shopping for 316 parts and not, like, taking this into salt water, 18-8 is going to be perfectly fine. Uh, so this, I mean, the 300 series. So, okay, let's back up a little bit. So the difference, you have 316. There's a bunch of different grades. And a lot of it, the differences are the constituents between the two. So you'll actually prefer one for its formability yeah. versus another where that machines better. Yeah. So there's a lot of okay. new shows. So I agree. I mean, to get into the 300 series, you need to have a conversation of what is the best material. You could use 17.4. Yeah. You can use other materials that are Well, 18.8 still the 300 series. It's, it's, the, it's interchange. 18.8 is uh, interchangeable with 304. Right. It's 18% right. chromium and 8% nickel. Yep. And 316 is 20% chromium right. and 6% nickel, right? Yes. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, yes, yes. So you prefer 304. There's, there's, <laughs> I prefer it because there's barely a difference. There is more longevity or, mm -hmm. or more corrosion resistance, but you only notice it if you're in a marine environment, sure. number one. And 316 is like double the cost of 304. Fun times. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag just saying. Steve, tell me about Boeing. So I watched a video recently <laughs> on YouTube um, from a great channel called uh, Cold Fusion. And they, five days ago, as of this recording, five days ago, um, they published a video that was nothing really new if you've been following the Boeing situation, but... I'd like to think I've been following the Boeing situation, but there was a lot of things that I missed. Right. Um, and this was a great up to speed. So as bad as like the Boeing situation is, and I'm about to highlight a lot of other things that people may have, a, a few other things that people may have missed. You also, the, dis, the short disclaimer is you have to consider that there are 100,000 flights, commercial airliner flights, that take place every day. Right. Every single right. day, there's 100,000 plus flights. This is a small percentage. Right. Like the odds that you are going to have a problem on a Boeing aircraft are still super limited. Mm -hmm. That being said, <laughs> this video had solid footage of like somebody's like point of view recording. I think they had like uh, video recording glasses oh. walking through a Boeing facility and asking the workers on the aircraft, would you fly on this plane? And they were all basically saying, oh, God, no. Oh, that's rough. No. That sounds vaguely illegal, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, well, fortunately, it wasn't the, it wasn't Cold Fusion's video recording. They just found the footage of sure. somebody that did it. But you know what's also... Never mind. I'm not going to get into uh, <laughs> the whistle. What happened nope. to the whistleblower? Nope. But um, you know, there, there was a lot of like I didn't. I never saw the footage of the wheel falling oh, yeah. off. Right. I never saw the footage of the plane taking off and the hydraulic fu fluid just spewing <laughs> out of the landing gear. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the uh, the report on the Boeing plane that landed and then veered off of the runway because they lost control of mm -hmm. the plane during landing. At least you were already on the ground. Uh, still probably really traumatic. Um, I wasn't as shocked by the video footage of the uh, the one Boeing plane with an engine spewing flames sure. because I don't know if I can b blame Boeing on that. Yeah. Number one, if I saw flames out of the window of my seat, I would think that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Would you start clapping like you landed? <laughs> yes. I would be one of those white people. Um, number two, uh, isn't that the engine manufacturer's fault? Like, like I remember touring the Boeing facility, and they were like, we make the plane to like right. 80, 90%. Once the plane leaves our hands, it's still up to the air carrier or the customer to source who 
puts in the interior of the plane and what engines they use. Yeah. The only thing that comes with the plane from us is like a quarter tank of gas or something right. like mm-hmm. that. That is an interesting point that you bring up. I just want to mention it quickly because the like Boeing, they're an airframe manufacturer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So they do. Yeah, they do everything. They do uh, uh, the control surfaces. They do everything. But to your point, there's a lot of other pieces. Like the end user can define what kind of uh, instrument cluster that they want, what kind of engine that they want. Their interior is completely up to a third party. And so Boeing's getting a lot of heat. Yeah. And some of it is probably rightly so based on, you know, they are running hydraulics, they are running the landing gears, things like that. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the engine is a different supplier. And it's on the carrier's responsibility, too, to maintain these aircraft. Right. So there's a right. lot of shared problems here. Well, and and I think when when we look at, like you said, there's over a, like 100,000 flights a day. There's a lot of flights. And so, and there's always issues with different planes. One, I will say that I think this might be more of a 737 issue than a Boeing issue at mm-hmm. this point because there's been a couple 757s that have had issues. I've seen that. But about 90% of the issues are 737s. Right. Yeah, but like it was really scary when the video also highlights some some major issues happening to uh, the Dreamliner, the 787-9, sure. yeah. Yeah. which is the latest in greatest Boeing and it's already having problems are we serious yeah I honestly think in some ways with Boeing the older the plane the more likely you're going to be fine (laughs) Um, because obviously but I I, but I like I was saying like I think like you said there's like 100,000 flights a day is this becoming because of the whole door blowing off thing that was a major problem I acknowledge like that was a big issue but are we more is it more sensationalized in the news now because that happened? And so now we're seeing it I happen more and we're more. Seeing, yeah, it's hyper-focused. I mean, yeah, it, it is hyper-focused. Single, so. It is hyper-focused. I, I feel like these things were already but, happening, but, but now we're just but, really focused on it. But to the point of like hyper-focus, what makes me a really sad panda and a sad American <laughs> is, is that like the biggest government contractor, the biggest private government contractor to the United States government is Boeing. Mm-hmm. It is Boeing. So when Boeing gets sued, it's it's the US government that's paying for it. <laughs> but that could also yeah. be the US government. Their their standards in terms of what Boeing gives them could be different and than a, than an airline got, carrier. You got a good point. But like, you know, man, can and, I and just knowing that like, you know, the 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 people near the exit row suing for a billion dollars. That's a big number. The, that's, that's they're, they're, a go, lot of they're, money. Go, they're straight up aiming for the three comma club. <laughs> but I'm not gonna lie, I can't deny, you know, as again, as an American, if that wheel popped off and landed on my car, like it did that one Corolla, yeah. uh, you know, I'd, I'd be I would be listening to Louis Prima on repeat. And it's from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> well, although, to be fair, I bet you that Corolla is still running. Probably. <laughs> oh, for sure. Probably. You know, it's funny that, so I travel about once a month. I'm, uh, recently, it's been twice a month. Uh, Deepa's not too happy about that, but that's fine. That's a different issue. And to be honest, <laughs> I see all these concerns, and the biggest trouble I still have is I just want to get on the plane faster. Yeah. Stop putting your carry-on luggage on your overhead compartment. Stop struggling. Just get to your oh, seat. Stop putting oh, your jacket in the overhead compartment before <laughs> everyone else has sat down. Just let me like, get on the plane fast and let's take off. That's all, that's all I want. Yeah, people people we, lose basic human decency when they get on a plane. I'm sorry. Like it's, They really do. The they worst. really do. It's be, post-pandemic, has gotten so much worse. And I can't. Is people in the back who, anyone who's not in the first three seats, as soon as you land, they're standing up. Where are you going? (laughs) (laughs) We're all all going to the same place, babe. They've never been on a bus before. Where are you going? (laughs) Or the people in the first few rows who they're sitting, you're sitting in the window, they're sitting in the aisle, and they don't stand up. Oh, no. And you're like, are you going to be one of those people who like waits till everyone's off the plane? So I have to wait. I start to get panicky. I'm like, where are you going? The people who stand up right away, they're like, their only their only excuse is well uh i got to make a connecting flight stop being poor <laughs> get a direct flight that's one way what's the problem <laughs> what's the problem <laughs> for me yeah. i loved it <laughs> where can they find more info about us amdonline.org/resources like share subscribe bing bong